Welcome to the Way Forward Regenerative Conversation Podcast number 28, The Middle East in Crisis, a conversation with Barbara Slavin. I'm the producer, Jim Burke. With the humanitarian crisis and ongoing conflict in Gaza and the Middle East on all of our minds, passions run high as world leaders and nations attempt to navigate the complexities of this difficult situation and help all parties find a mutually agreeable solution. This episode features an in-depth look at the pressing issues facing the Middle East with Barbara Slavin. From the roots of the Iran-U.S. confrontation to the humanitarian and political crisis in Gaza, Barbara offers her comprehensive insights into the region's turmoil. Her analysis not only highlights the intricacies of these conflicts, but also discusses potential pathways to peace, emphasizing the importance of diplomatic and multilateral efforts. Barbara Slaben is a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center and a lecturer in international affairs at George Washington University. With a career spanning journalism and policy analysis, her rich journalistic background includes coverage of key foreign policy issues and firsthand reporting from the region. Barbara's insight into the Iran-U.S. dynamic and her advocacy for nuanced, informed approaches to the conflict make her a respected figure in international affairs, and she has emerged as a leading voice on U.S. foreign policy, particularly regarding Iran and the Middle East. Barbara's work includes founding the Future of Iran Initiative and authoring Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, reflecting her deep engagement with the complexities of international relations and conflict resolution. She's a contributor to the Stimson Center's Middle East Perspectives, where you can find her article, American Deaths Add More Reason to End the War in Gaza Now. And now for our host, Dr. John Izu and Alain Gauthier. On behalf of my co-host, Alain Gauthier, and our producer, Jim Burke, I want to welcome you to this episode of The Way Forward Regenerative Conversations podcast, where we explore issues and ideas about the future of humanity and planet. Welcome, we're glad to have you. Alon, I'm really excited about the timely conversation and topic for our podcast today, which concerns the present situation and really the historical situation in the Middle East, both in in Israel and Gaza, but also Iran, really the complex set of issues that we face today in the Middle East. And I couldn't help but think of my own introduction to the Middle East. As the listeners know, I was a Presbyterian minister in my first career. And when I was studying at McCormick Theological Seminary, I had the opportunity to go and spend uh, six months uh, studying in Egypt, in Cairo, in the spring of 1980. And many of you may remember, it was really kind of a very interesting time. The year before, Israel and Egypt had signed uh, the peace accord, which is held to this day. And I went with a kind of typical, I think, person of my generation's view of the Middle East, uh, which was that Israel had kind of fought for its existence. It was a big ally of the U.S., And I kind of went with a pro-Israel bias, I guess. And the, of course, the revolution in Iran had happened. And uh, the first president I got to vote for, Jimmy Carter, in many ways, you could argue, lost his presidency in large part because of the the Iranian hostage uh, situation. And while I was there in Egypt, we spent time both in Israel, in Syria, in Lebanon, and on the West Bank. And as a young, early 20s person, I was introduced for the first time to the complexity of the situation in the in the Middle East. I got to sit down with Palestinians on the West Bank telling me stories of encounters their families had had with Israeli soldiers. The settlements were just starting to happen on contested land in the West Bank at the time were seen as temporary. And... I can't help but think that for my whole adult lifetime, this has been a hotspot. One could argue that we've advanced little in those years. Uh, Iran and the United States and the West have perhaps as contested a relationship as they've ever had. 
Uh, we now have uh, the war raging in in Gaza. Uh, and just as a personal aside, one of the we spent a lot of time with the Coptic Orthodox Church when I was in Cairo. And one of the people we got to know really well was a guy named Bishop Samuel, who had studied at Princeton and was routinely believed to be the next pope of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Uh, and in a kind of poignant footnote for me personally, he was sitting near Anwar Sadat the year after I met him and was killed in that same ambush. So with that as kind of a backdrop, I'm really interested to talk to, have this conversation today with a guest who knows an awful lot about these issues. Uh, Alon, anything you want to say before we uh, invite Barbara in? Yes, I too am very interested in hearing what Barbara has to share with us. Because as you said, it's a very complex situation. And looking at it from different perspectives is, I think, what is needed. And particularly in what is happening in this country now about this conflict, look at the perspectives that we can take in, not to come up with a judgment too quickly. I think that's really what this podcast is all about, the way forward. Let's explore ideas and have an open mind. So whatever bias you come in around all of these issues, open up your mind, open up your heart. And Barbara Slavin, let me welcome you into the into the podcast studio. So first of all, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So Barbara, we always like to start more personally on these podcasts. So tell us a little bit about you've spent your life as a, a very successful, influential journalist, as well as really wound up focusing your work on international affairs. And so we're curious, what what lit a fire in Barbara Slavin to, A, become a journalist, and second, to really focus in the area of international relationships? So tell us a little about that. Sure. Well, I'm the grandchild of immigrants from Eastern Europe. And so foreign languages were being spoken around me when I was a kid. And I remember very vividly in, in at the time of, um, I guess we were approaching the, maybe it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe it was Sputnik, it was certainly a time of US tension with the Soviet Union. And I was trying to explain to my classmates in elementary school that human beings lived in Russia too. And I remember the kids saying, go back to Russia, Barbara, go back to Russia. So in college, I studied Russian, and in the last semester of my senior year, I went to what was then called Leningrad to, to work on my Russian language, and it was a complete eye-opener. Not only did I learn a lot about the Soviet Union uh, and the reality of it, but I found my calling. I decided that no one had really written about this country in a way that was accurate and that it was my job to do this, so I decided I would become a journalist. Of course, life intercedes, and I never wound up being a correspondent in Moscow. I did go for brief periods, but I wound up being based in China, Japan, and Egypt. And so my focus switched, and I became very interested in East Asia and very interested in the Middle East. And it's interesting, John, I was in Egypt from 1985 to 89, which were years in which Egypt was trying to get out from its ostracism because of signing that peace treaty with Israel. And it was also when the Palestine Liberation Organization was coming to terms with the reality of Israel and eventually moving toward recognizing Israel, something that Israel has yet to do to the Palestinian national movement, really. I hope that answers. I've always been interested in adversaries and how, why we're adversaries and what can be done to improve these relationships. That's that's a long-term focus for me. Yeah, I was smiling more in an ironic way, Barbara, when you said that you were trying to explain that the real people lived in Russia. And they said, why don't you go to Russia? It's such a good just example of how we get into a mode of we think we know what what the what reality what reality is and, and I'm curious what led you to be you know, said you spent time in Egypt but so much of your work has wound up focusing on Iran and the Middle East where did that where did that spark really happen for you well i actually wrote about the iranian revolution uh, as a very young journalist for the new york times i was on a section called the week in review and for some reason it was my duty for years to write about short items about the revolution, 
Uh, and later, the hostage crisis when Iran held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. So I became familiar with the issues and the names. And then later in the Middle East, covered the Iran-Iraq war from the vantage point of Iraq, which was an Egyptian ally, uh, but followed that, the Iran-Contra scandal, all of the issues involved with the Iran-Iraq war and the U.S. relationship with Iran. I first went to Iran in 1996. I was a diplomatic reporter at the time for USA Today, and which was flush with cash and knew my background. My editor at the time wanted me to do a story about the situation of women in the Muslim world. And I said, well, let me go back to Egypt. I lived there four years. I know a lot of people. And why don't I go to Iran? I had always been interested in the country, but hadn't had the opportunity to go. So my first visit was in 1996. And it too was an eye opener because instead of the stereotype of women in black and and very submissive and so on, I found extremely feisty and uh, uh, interesting, well-educated women who were doing all sorts of things there at the time. In fact, I found that Iranian women, despite living under an Islamic republic, were in some ways more liberated than their Egyptian sisters, who seemed to be much more tradition-bound and much more religious uh, in a way than the Iranians were. So it was a start, and I had the opportunity, I was lucky enough to be able to return nine times. I was also covering U.S. foreign policy toward Iran, which was very interesting during that period, and it led to a book called Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, and eventually to, to work at think tanks trying to come up with better ideas about how to reduce the tensions between the U.S. and Iran and more broadly in in the region as a whole. So thank you for this. We we realize, of course, that Iran and the U.S. have had a tense relationship uh, for decades. And if you could walk us through the high points of the history that explains what is today. Well, look, the U.S. was very close to the Shah of Iran. And uh, was really surprised uh, that the Shah could not put down uh, a rebellion in 1978-79. The U.S. didn't know that the Shah had cancer, and that was certainly a factor. But the revolution against him was very broad. Many groups were not happy with his authoritarian regime. Leftists, clerics, Shia clerics who felt that he was not giving the Shia faith sufficient weight in society, all sorts of political opponents. And they came together under the charismatic leadership of Ayatollah, a cleric named Ayatollah Khomeini, and succeeded in getting members of the military to come to their side, members of the labor movement, oil workers, merchants in the bazaar, cross-section of Iranian society came together against the Shah and overthrew him in 1979. And the U.S. never really was able, I mean, scrambled to try to have some sort of relationship with the new government there. It was still very worried about the Soviet Union, uh, then Iran's neighbor, that they would take advantage of the revolution and extend their influence. But the hostage crisis occurred. And frankly, after that, I mean, it was very, very difficult. Iran violated every diplomatic norm by holding American diplomats hostage for that long period. It destroyed Jimmy Carter's chances for a second term. It led, frankly, to much of the military intervention that we've seen by the United States, because there was a failed effort to rescue the hostages in 1980. Out of that came a so-called rapid deployment force, which eventually morphed into central command got involved during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s in in escorting ships, Kuwaiti ships, down the Persian Gulf, got involved in shooting wars with with Iran's navy. It was a very, very uh, perilous time. At the same time, the Israelis were arguing that we should support Iran, which Israel at the time saw as a bigger threat than Iraq. And so the U.S. also sold weapons to Iran under what became known as the Iran-Contra scandal. It was a very confusing time. U.S. also had to deal with the fact that we had hostages in Lebanon being held by groups that were close to Iran, What the groups that, that coalesced into what we now know as Hezbollah. So that was a very tumultuous time in the Middle East. 
After the death of Ayatollah Khomeini at the end of the Iran-Iraq War in 1989, there was a period of opportunity, some opportunity, I think, between the U.S. and Iran, particularly after Bill Clinton was elected for a second time. In his second term, the Iranians had a president named Mohammad Hatami, who reached out to the United States. And this was when I started going there. And there was a period of cultural exchanges, all sorts of people-to-people exchanges. It was easy as a journalist to get a visa to go there. Iranian society was opening up, becoming more liberal. And I think there were real opportunities that could have been pushed further. But one one constant in U.S.-Iran relations is that every time something starts to look good, we get a change of administration and everything goes backwards again. So Clinton leaves. We get George W. Bush, who did not have the same sense about Iran, was much much more pro-Israel. And then after 9-11, lumped Iran with, with Iraq and North Korea in a so-called axis of evil uh, at a time when Iran was not only sympathetic to the United States, but had actually helped the United States in Afghanistan overthrow the Taliban regime, which had harbored al-Qaeda, the group that attacked the United States on 9-11. So relations went back into the deep freeze and got worse because Iran had a very active nuclear program, which was advancing. The U.S. refused to talk to the Iranians. President Bush, his administration, which had lumped Iran into the so-called axis of evil, refused to talk to the Iranians about their nuclear program unless Iran would would unilaterally halt that program. And needless to say, the Iranians wouldn't do that. So European countries took up the slack for a while, Britain, France, and Germany. And in Bush's second term, the U.S. did actually join these talks, but there was no real progress until President Obama came in. He he changed the tone and tenor of U.S. outreach toward Iran. He famously gave a, a, a speech on the occasion of Iranian New Year, wishing Iranians well, using the official name of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, for the first time by a U.S. president. He wrote two letters to the, the then and and continuing supreme leader of the country, Ayatollah Khamenei, who succeeded Ayatollah Khomeini. Don't get the two confused. And in Obama's second term, there were multilateral negotiations that led to a landmark nuclear agreement. It rolled back the Iranian program, and it it was intended to keep Iran from the ability to make a nuclear weapon until the year 2031. But once again, we had regime change in the United States. Following Obama, we got Donald Trump, as we know, has uh, no small uh, opinion of himself, and decided that he could negotiate single-handedly a better agreement than one that it had taken the international community 12 years (laughs) to reach. So Trump pulled out of this Iran nuclear agreement in 2018, reimposed economic sanctions, which had been lifted, um, and tensions between the United States rose, not surprisingly. Iran waited a year before it began to advance its nuclear program again. It wanted to see if the Europeans were capable of continuing to trade with Iran despite U.S. sanctions. Europeans could not do that. And so Iran started to to accelerate that the nuclear program, and it also began to attack shipping in the Persian Gulf. It attacked a Saudi uh, oil facility, and started the Iran-backed groups in in Iraq started attacking Americans. Uh, U.S. eventually responded by assassinating the most important general in Iran, a man named Qasem Soleimani, in 2020. Iran retaliated again against U.S. bases, fortunately did not kill any Americans, but it was very tense. It, it, it was as tense then, in some ways more tense than it even is now, uh, where the U.S. and Iran are again ranged on other sides. I left out of this conversation perhaps the, the dumbest thing the United States has done in the Middle East under George W. Bush, which was to invade Iraq and overthrow the regime of Saddam Hussein thereby not only eliminating a buffer against the expansion of Iranian influence in the region, but essentially opening the way for Iran 
to become the most important foreign power in Iraq and to extend its influence all the way through Syria into Lebanon, where, of course, we had Hezbollah, so that you you now have the dreaded Shia crescent going from Tehran through Iraq, Syria, and in, into Lebanon. Had the U.S. not invaded Iraq, hundreds of thousands of people would be alive who are not alive today, including many American troops and, of course, countless numbers of Iraqis. And that, that ac- action by the United States so destabilized the Middle East that I think we see the results in many ways today. It it was extremely unfortunate. And, um, you know, whenever I see references to Iran's malign behavior in the Middle East, I have to remind myself, well, who gave Iran the opportunity to, to play in these troubled waters? Who destabilized the Middle East? And I think the United States really has to take a large share of the blame for that. Barbara, I couldn't help but think uh, when you were talking about, you know, our support for the for the Shah, right? That I just got back from Chile, and of course, you know, in the, in the same same more or less period of time in the early seventies, where the Nixon administration basically festered and supported a coup to overthrow the democratically elected president of Chile, leading to the Pinochet dictatorship, and I can help but think of how these unintended consequences of the actions that we take and the way we've kind of stumbled into these situations. But you said something earlier that's really interesting. I have a friend from Iran and who I play tennis with, and I had he still has family there. And I'd asked him about Iran a couple of years ago. And, and one of the things he helped me see that you talked about was I think a lot of people in the West, especially in America and Canada, have a kind of a unilateral kind of a kind of this monolithic view of Iran as mostly extremists. But he was talking about this very thing you talked about, this real tension in Iranian society. So talk about, you know, most uh, Westerners, and we'll get to the the situation in Israel and Gaza, for those of you who are eager to get there, but so important that we understand the situation with Iran. Mm -hmm. Tell us what Iranian society is really like and the cross currents that really are going on there that I think we're unaware of often, you know, with this more monolithic view of what it's like there. Sure. I should just point out, you mentioned Pinochet, of course, the U.S., the CIA overthrew the Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953 after the nationalization of of the British oil company there and put the Shah back on the throne. So 25 years later, there was a revolution against the Shah. Again, what goes around comes around. In terms of Iranian society, I mean, that's why I kept going back, because it was so interesting. I would say that the Iranian government now is more unpopular than it has ever been. It has a base of maybe 20% of the population, many of them people who work for the government in one form or fashion and are dependent on the government. But the the majority of the country and certainly of the younger generations are sick and tired of the restrictions. Women are still legally obliged to cover their hair and dress modestly. And most Iranians, Iranian women simply don't want to do that anymore. They're very internet savvy. They know what's going on elsewhere. There's a huge Iranian diaspora and brain drain. You mentioned your Iranian friend. There may be a million Iranians in the U.S., five million more, primarily in Canada and Europe, Australia. And many of them are still in touch with family back home. So Iranians in Iran know very well uh, what they're missing out on. And they're well-educated people. This is one thing the regime actually did right. It did educate society. And that includes women who have over 90% literacy. They have excellent universities. People get their PhDs and then leave and come to Silicon Valley. Thank you very much, Iran. There have been periodic protests against the regime, starting in 1999 with student protests. And since that time, there have been protests more and more frequently for a variety of reasons, economic protests, human rights protests. In 2022, a young woman died in police custody for the crime of not wearing adequate covering. She was beaten and went into a coma and died. And there were demonstrations that spread throughout Iran, led by women, the so-called Women Life Freedom Movement, against enforced hijab, 
but against much more and calling for the death of Ayatollah Khamenei and the overthrow of the Islamic Republic and its replacement by popularly, popularly elected government. So this is a country that looks powerful from the outside, but has a very, very vulnerable core. I sometimes call Iran the porcupine country. All these, these quills, these spikes sticking out all over and its proxy groups throughout the region, but inside very vulnerable, very unpopular. Thank you for this insight about the Iranian society. So let's turn to Gaza and the present situation has become there a major humanitarian crisis, as well as a point of conflict between Arab states and the West. So what is your take on the situation and what is at stake, particularly given what you said about Iran at this time? Yeah, it, it's not so much a conflict with Arab, Arabs as with Iran-backed Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have to be clear that we actually have seen an evolution in the Middle East over the years where Arab governments, admittedly all authoritarian, none of them elected, have recognized Israel either formally or de facto. And just before the explosion of violence, even Saudi Arabia was talking about normalization normalization of relations with Israel. It's still talking about that, but with a with a price tag, with a very big price tag. But Iran had already perfected this model of supporting Arabs who were discriminated against in their own countries, primarily Shia Arabs, starting with Shia Arabs in Lebanon, where they were a plurality, uh, but were not well treated historically. The Sunnis and Christian groups in Lebanon ran the show. In 1982, the Israelis, feeling, I guess, secure because they had a peace treaty with Egypt, invaded Lebanon to go after the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was their bete noire at the time. And the PLO was kicked out of Lebanon, and instead we saw the rise of the group that came Hezbollah, which is now the most powerful military, economic, and political actor in Lebanon. And Hezbollah is the template, it has even been used as a trainer to help all these other groups that have popped up over, over the years. Iran supports Another Arab group, this one's Sunni, that's Hamas, which emerged organically in the West Bank and Gaza from Israeli occupation of those territories since 1967, since the 1967 war. After the Iran-Iraq war, the Iranians felt sort of shut out of the diplomacy, the peace diplomacy that, that occurred. They weren't invited to a peace conference in Madrid. They latched on to Hamas and another group, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and proceeded to try to disrupt the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians and other Arabs. So that, that relationship was built. Then we have Iraq. I mentioned that U.S. invaded Iraq. Iran already had one group called the Badr Brigade. This was made up of Iraqi exiles who had fled Iraq, Shia Iraqis, who had fled Iraq and gone to Iran in the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq war. After the U.S. overthrew Saddam, the Badr Brigade came right back in, following the logistics tale of the U.S. Army, right back in through southern Iraq. And then Iran also started creating other proxy groups in the country. So there are kind of alphabet soup of militias now that have Iranian backing and that collectively run Iraq. And one of the things that will be interesting to see is whether the U.S. will be able to retain any kind of military, diplomatic or economic presence in Iraq, frankly, the way things are going. As we're speaking, three American soldiers have died in a an attack uh, on a U.S. base and actually in, in Jordan on the border with Syria and Iraq, drones fired by an Iran-backed militia group, most likely in Syria. What's happened since the 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 Gaza war has escalated is that all these other various groups have decided that they must show solidarity with the Palestinians in Gaza who are being massacred. And so they have found various ways to, to show their displeasure. And the easiest thing to do is to hit isolated Americans on small bases in Syria and Iraq. They're 900 Americans in Syria, 2,500 in Iraq, and then some others uh, in Jordan as well, who are exposed and vulnerable to drone attack. I left out one other militia, 
which is the Houthis. Of course, they're more than a militia. They're actually running most of Yemen now. And this group is farthest away from Iran ideologically in in some ways, and they practice a faith that is kind of a, a hybrid between Sunni and Shiism. But they have been at odds with Saudi Arabia, which is Iran's traditional rival in the region, and so Iran has backed them. And the Houthis have been taking pot shots at shipping in the Red Sea, so severe that the United States and Britain decided they had to retaliate against Yemen, one of the most miserable war-torn places on earth. The U.S. has just put the Houthis back on a list of designated global terrorists a list that the Trump administration put the group on and the U.S. had lifted when Joe Biden came in. Oh, I left out also that Iran's nuclear program is advancing very, very rapidly now, such that Iran could probably make a nuclear weapon in six months if it made the political decision to do so. So what we're seeing is a kind of, you know, metastasis of of the Gaza war all over the region. It's not yet World War III, but there are there are people dying. There are skirmishes. The U.S. is attacking Iran-backed militias. The U.S. has assassinated an Iraqi militia leader. Israel is killing uh, Iranian generals in Syria. Uh, Iran has attacked Iraqi Kurdistan and even Pakistan <laughs> after a terrorist attack in Iran that was blamed on either ISIS or or separatist ethnic separatist groups. So it's just it, it's like a shooting gallery. I mean, pot shots in every which way and sometimes hitting the target you want and sometimes not. But it's extremely destabilizing and worrisome, especially at a time, you know, the United States was trying to to pivot from the Middle East. We keep talking about the pivot to Asia and we keep getting sucked right back in. You know, Biden is supporting the Israelis at the same time pressing on them the need for a ceasefire. 26,000 people killed in Gaza. The whole territory of the Gaza Strip looks like Dresden during World War II. It's been bombed into oblivion and the reconstruction is going to be a very long and difficult process. The region will be traumatized for a very long time. And of course, the Israelis still have hostages being held as we speak. And the Israelis have lost 1,200 people in the initial Hamas attack of October 7th and uh, several hundred more soldiers who have died in the fighting in, in Gaza. So it's it's really as bleak as we've seen in, in a very long time. I can't think of a situation as bad since maybe the beginning of the Iraq war. Barbara, I want to go in, in two directions, but let's start with, you know, for most of our lifetimes, the Middle East has been a hot spot. And, and you know, the for years, people would, you know, in the popular press would say things like, if there's going to be a third world war, this is where it will begin, which is, you know, actually probably unlikely in that sense now, given the way the world has changed. But people, a constant concern about this really escalating and, and getting out of control. How worried should people be that this really could expand? If you had to clear your crystal ball with some Windex and figure out what you think is going to happen, what's your best sense of how dangerous this situation really is in terms of, I mean, obviously not talking about the tragedy in terms of how many people are dying and suffering, that will goes without saying, and I want to get to that next. But in terms of the international situation, how worried should we be and how do we get out of it? the situation that we're in? What's your best guess on both? Well, we should be worried. However, I think that the Biden administration and Iran do not want World War III to start in the Middle East. I mentioned how vulnerable Iran is internally because of all the dissatisfaction with the with the government there. I left out the government's poor economic performance, which is only partly due to U.S. sanctions, but also due to corruption and, and mismanagement. And I don't think the Biden administration wants. I mean, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, very foolishly gave a speech days before the war broke out, where he talked about how the Middle East had never been so quiet. And if that's not calling down on you the wrath of God, I don't know what. I mean, it was a very foolish remark. The the tensions and problems in the Middle East have many causes. And the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is more than a century old. Israel was created uh, on the, the basis of 
a tremendous injustice to Palestinians, many of whom were forced to flee their homes during the Israeli War of Independence. Maybe if the Arab states had accepted Israel in 1948, that wouldn't have happened, but it did happen. And of course, that, that tragedy has led to more expulsions and more Israeli occupation of areas that had been Palestinian. So this is an open sore. I mean, in, until this is resolved, you will always have instability. But you have many, many bad authoritarian repressive governments that periodically face protests from their own people. The United States picks and chooses its friends and allies, and some of our friends are are pretty despicable and have horrible track records when it comes to human rights. I was reading recently about the United Arab Emirates, which is supporting some of the worst warlords in Sudan and in Libya, another country that is chronically unstable. So there are plenty of reasons, you know, even if we don't talk about the US and Iran, why the Middle East would be such a, a powder keg. The, the inability of Israel to resolve the Palestinian question and the fact that Iran has decided to make this a cause for Iran is, is, a, is another major factor. And if Iran were to accept the reality of Israel, that would go a long way, I think, toward diffusing tensions. And one interesting thing that perhaps people hadn't noticed, we have a blog at the Stimson Center that I edit called Middle East Voices. And I had an Iranian writer who actually pointed out that Iran has twice now, or or more even, signed on to communiques, a UN, Arab League, Organization of Islamic Conference, that recognize a two-state solution for Israel-Palestine. So Iran is not calling for the destruction of Israel if it's signed on to these communiques. It is calling for a two-state solution. Of course, devil being in the details, what sort of two-state solution? But that's something one could build on, and that is the international consensus, that this is the only way to uh, to bring any kind of stability to the region is to give the Palestinians their own state and have Israel relinquish, frankly, its hold over, over the lives of millions of Palestinians. I was thinking of, it did a blog, you were talking about, you know, if Arab states have ex had accepted Israel, you know, in, in 1948, I was saying I did a blog recently with some title, something like, uh, small things become big things, consider it a maxim. <laughs> and I was talking about how almost every problem will become a big problem if you don't address it when it's a small problem, right? And right. I think we see that again and again and again through through history. So just to finish on this point, sounds like you're saying that that at least Iran and the United States have a vested interest in not letting this expand mm -hmm. so that there's a little bit of a governor on that, but still a very precarious situation where unintended consequences, almost all international things that grow are unintended consequences of things you couldn't predict would would happen. So it sounds like you have some optimism about it being contained, but that it remains an incredibly complex and, and, and dangerous situation that we're in right now. Yeah, yeah, very much. And um, I'm also very worried, frankly, we have our elections coming up. What if Trump returns? A lot of Republicans have been complaining, oh, Biden should do more, you know, against Iran. Well, I mean, what are they suggesting? The U.S. or has is not only maintaining sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration, but keeps adding new ones. Are they suggesting the United States attack Tehran? I mean, how is that going to calm the Middle East? I worry a lot about what happens if if we have yet another change of regime in the United States, and they decide somehow they have to get tougher than we we already are. So I I would hope that I know that messages are being passed to Iran to keep a lid on this, and and we will see what what they do. They very quickly denied any involvement in the attack on the Americans that led to those deaths in Jordan. And there is a process going on to try to get a long-term ceasefire in Gaza, which is the one thing that would diffuse the tensions, it would allow the Houthis to stand down, uh, and the Iraqi militias, I think, as well. If, if the fighting uh, in Gaza stops and the focus switches to humanitarian relief for Gaza.
Iran intervenes through militias, does it make the situation more challenging in a way? Because are these militias, quote, controllable? <laughs> you know, can they act on their own and based on the generations of traumas that are probably part of that history? You know, does it does it make the situation more explosive than if it was a state to state kind of relationship? Well, it's it's complex. I mean, Hezbollah is in effect more powerful than the Lebanese state. Hezbollah is more powerful than the Lebanese army. So it kind of depends. And the nature of the relationships between Iran and these proxies also varies. So Iran and Hezbollah are very, very close. And I think one of the reasons that even though we've seen a lot of fighting across the Lebanese border, we haven't seen a new war in, in Lebanon is because Hezbollah understands that Lebanon is too economically fragile to sustain another massive conflagration there. I would I would think that although Iran helps the Houthis, apparently not only gives them weapons and training and has given them some intelligence, did Iran tell the Houthis to attack Western shipping in the Red Sea? That I don't know. It may have been the Houthis' bright idea. They are uh, very... Uh, aggressive and ideological group, uh, and they're fresh off defeating the Saudis, the Emiratis, and indeed the United States indirectly in the Yemen war. And they have a genuine ideological affinity with Hamas and the Palestinians and against Israel. So this may have been their own idea. We, we really don't know. I think in Iraq, it depends on the group. Some of them may be acting on their own, but again, they're benefiting from having had training and weapons from, from the Iranians and from their association with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps' Quds Force, the or Jerusalem Force, which is the external arm of the IRGC. So as far as we know, is there some solidarity between these militias that could explain some of their moves? Yes, very much so. It's 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 what they call the axis of resistance. Yes. It is an informal uh, or even formal alliance of groups that are close to Iran, that are opposed to Israel and support Palestinian aspirations and would also like the United States to to reduce its or even eliminate its military presence in in the Middle East. And and yeah, it's a very potent alliance among groups. Barbara, let's talk a bit about Gaza and and the two state. It feels to me, and I think this is objectively true, that we're probably further from a two state solution maybe than any time since I was there and you know studying in Egypt in 19, 1980. It was a really interesting article recently in the New York Times by a Jewish uh, journalist talking about the generational gap in America in terms of how they see this situation. And he made a really interesting point that the oldest generation in America remember like, you know, kind of the early history of Israel and connected to the Holocaust and, you know, the emergence of an Israeli state and then the Arab states attacking Israel several times and the terrorist attacks. And then there's a the middle generation. They remember the peace accords and Sadat and Begin and Carter signing the, the accords and this hopeful and Itzhak Rabin. And, and then there the whole really younger generation that have mostly know Israel under Benjamin Netanyahu, who really has made it clear in his actions as the, the leader of Israel and in his rhetoric, that he not only does not want a two-state solution, but one could say has sabotaged that possibility over the last 14, 15 years. So just what's your, I mean, obviously the situation, the, the humanitarian crisis is so heartbreaking. Some people say, let's have a ceasefire. It's clear Israel does not want to do that. What's your sense? Again, my sense is we're as far from a two-state solution than we've ever been. And almost I feel like now the die is cast, and even though Netanyahu is incredibly unpopular, the journalist made the point that Israelis are very much aligned. Now, only like 20% of Israelis now support a two-state solution. So what's your sense of, of that? Well, you're probably right, but that we can't just sit on our hands and do nothing. I mean, if we've learned anything since October 7th, it is that Something like this, an issue like this left unresolved, will continue to cause instability, suffering, death. Uh, 
we have, I think, some cards to play in the fact that the Saudis are dangling normalization with Israel if there is movement toward a Palestinian state. And of course, this would be the ultimate seal of approval, the ultimate Arab seal of approval on, on Israel, if it were to be able to get that kind of agreement. We need regime change urgently in Israel, as you pointed out. I mean, it's not just since 2009, Bibi Netanyahu has been working against Palestinian aspirations since the 1990s. And he has always been an opponent of a, of a Palestinian state of any kind, or even Palestinian self-determination of any kind. He needs to go, clearly. You need a more neutral government in Israel without all these right-wing crazies who are talking about resettling Gaza and forcing the Palestinians into Egypt, uh, wherever else they can, can send them. And you need regime change in the Palestinian Authority, which is moribund and corrupt, led by an 88-year-old man who was elected once for one term and has been in power since 2005. Are other individuals, technocrats and others within Palestinian society who could more ably lead Palestinians in any future talks? Um, it's funny, you know, I was thinking before October 7th that, that that what was needed was a one-state solution where everyone under Israeli rule had the same rights. But after October 7th, I think I'm actually going back to two states because I don't think they can live under the same – I mean, it, it just it, – it doesn't work. It won't work. And the Palestinians would ine inevitably be horribly discriminated against under that sort of situation. We have a structure. We have something like 72% of the world's governments have recognized a state of Palestine, at least theoretically. There is the Palestinian Authority. There is the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is the umbrella group for Palestinians. There are Palestinian diplomats around the world. So I think we should take what we have the structures and the that we have and try to build on them in, in a way that is realistic. Obviously, it's going to take a long time. First, the most urgent need is to save the lives of those who can be saved, whether they be Israeli hostages or Palestinian civilians, a half million of whom are facing famine as we speak and reconstructing Gaza restraining the violence on the West Bank, restraining the settlers there who have become vigilantes, uh, taking Palestinian land, shooting Palestinians. This has to be stabilized first. And, and then we can begin to talk about, about a proper division and creation of some sort of Palestinian entity that will give Palestinians a passport, a sense of identity that is not uh, tied up with Israeli occupation. Uh, I just don't see another way around it. I mean, if somebody has a better idea, I haven't heard it. And uh, again, you wanted if you want to diminish Iran's power in the region, do something for the Palestinians. Iran gains from these festering problems in the region. It benefits from discrimination against, you know, whether it's Arab Shia or Palestinians. They have they have causes they can latch on to and find willing partners who will take their money and weapons and training and become proxies. So deal with the root causes, not not, you know, don't try to paper it over. The Trump administration did with the so-called Abraham Accords. It it clearly is not a successful formula. And that is certainly a wild card in this, isn't it, with the US presidential election and who the heck knows what happens if there's regime change, so to speak, in the United States. So a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts. And one thing, Barbara, for Alana asks our final question, time always goes so quickly here, is I was thinking that when I went to the West Bank way back in 1980, I realized as a young American how invisible the suffering, the daily suffering of the Palestinians was to most people in America and in Canada, where I spent half my time. And I still think that's true even now, even with what's happening in Gaza, and which is not an anti-Israel sentiment. And I think that's the other thing this journalist made the point, this Jewish journalist, that what you're seeing on campuses is not anti-Semitism. It's a whole generation that has seen 
what's happened to the Palestinian people in a way that maybe the previous generation did not see. Now, they also may miss the nuances that we've talked about today that that put blame in many places. But I think we have the situation of the Palestinians must be humanized in 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 America, in Canada for us, I think, to see more clearly the importance of this issue being resolved in a way that gives dignity to all. Yeah, and and let's just point out how you know Israel has become very isolated internationally. After all, it's facing charges of genocide, and the United States, as Israel's chief supporter, has become isolated in in the global south. And so, is, Israel's actions reflect very poorly on on the U.S. And if we want to increase our own standing, we keep complaining about you know countries like China making inroads in the Middle East. We have to look at ourselves and look at the policies, the $4 billion a year we give to to Israel. People complain about Iran giving $100 million a year to Hamas. We give $4 billion in aid every year to Israel. So who is the enabler here of, of, of violence? It's we we can't we can't ignore our own role. Yeah, and you know, none of it, of course, excuses or or diminishes the horror of what happened in southern Israel, you know, on October 7th. And I just couldn't help but think of Gandhi, who said, an eye for an eye only means the whole world is blind, right? And so how does the cycle stop, right? And of course, those who are most powerful always have the most opportunity to stop the cycle. The least powerful cannot stop any cycle of violence. The most powerful must always stop first. So anyway, end of sermon. Alon, you have a final question for Barbara. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for focusing on the different aspects of the situation. And more generally, what gives you hope about the way forward for humanity in terms of international peace and stability? Mm -hmm. Well, younger the younger generation gives me hope. I'm a mother, so I have to be optimistic that my son's generation will resolve some of these issues. And uh, you, I mean, I think they they have, by and large, their their heads screwed on straight. They see uh, they see oppression. They oppose it. They they are more diverse than certainly in the United States than ever before. And so I I look to them. I really do. And even in Israel, I know the tr- the trend lines seem to be much more toward the right wing. But with the proper encouragement from all of the responsible governments and leaders in the world, I think even Israel will see that there is there has to be another way and that 2,000-pound uh, bombs are not the answer to their problems. Well, Barbara, first of all, thank you for the good work you've been doing all these decades. I don't want to make you sound old, but same thing. I am. All of us. Yeah. <laughs> all the work you've done all these decades to build understanding and to help people see situations more clearly. I want to appreciate that for you. Please look up Barbara's work at the Stimson Center, where she and I are both fellows, distinguished fellows at Stimson. Great work. And and Barbara, thank you for that, for that work. You know, in closing... Again, I think I think of so many of our guests over the last year when we asked them what gives them hope. Barbara, you joined the chorus of people who say younger people, the younger generations. And I think it's so important for us to remember that problems we thought could not be solved somehow do get solved. You know, I have friends in Ireland, you know, who couldn't have imagined that that Northern Ireland would be integrated back into Ireland. It's not perfect now. But they're not killing each other in the streets anymore. You're not named, you know, you're no longer defined by what street you have. I'm seeing you too in a in just a, a few days. And I can't help but think of uh, Bono's song, The Streets Have No Names, which he got from growing up in, in Ireland, where especially in Northern Ireland, the street you lived on defined who you were, which side you were on. Uh and and he was in, I think it was Ethiopia, where the streets literally had no names. And he kind of imagined a world where we weren't defined by the street that we lived on or the side that we were on. And so we hope today you, the listeners, have uh, gained a little more knowledge of the situation, the complexity of it, and perhaps how each one of us can weigh in with our own leaders to try to shape a different kind of future. So finally, I want to thank you, our listeners, for joining us. You're why we're here. As we always say, if you loved what you heard, 
please share it with others and let us know. If you like what you heard but think we could do better or have different topics or guests, please, we'd love to hear from you. Meanwhile, as we always like to remind you, history is not a, a future place waiting for us to arrive. It is defined and created by the things that we do now. So on behalf of uh, Alain Gauthier, my co-host, and Jim Burke, we'll see you next time on The Way Forward. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to our podcast, The Way Forward Regenerative Conversations. You have many choices, and we appreciate your interest and support. You can reach us at our email address, thewayforwardrc at gmail.com. Please share your thoughts and feedback with us. Only with your help can we make this a podcast you want to listen to and share with your friends. If you have guests you would like us to have a conversation with, please email us your recommendations. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Elders Action Network, who is building a movement of elders to address the environmental, governance, and social issues of our time. Their website is eldersaction.org. Until next time, I'm Jim Burke, and this is the Way Forward Regenerative Conversations podcast, which you can listen to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. In parting, may I wish you a regenerative present and future.